Okay, so this is another patient with in ophthalmos. So and when we look at our soft tissue windows, the key is looking at our bony windows from the coronal image where we can see a defect within the orbital floor. So this is in ophthalmos secondary to a orbital floor fracture. This is a 37-year-old female who presented with uh, enophthalmos and, diplop uh, and um, a, a facial nerve, uh, I'm sorry, a um, third nerve palsy. And on imaging, we can see that she has uh, enophthalmos and the soft tissue enhancing mass on the CT scan. Again, hypo-intense on T2. You can see it iso-intense with the brain parenchyma and again, avidly enhancing. This was sclerous cell carcinoma in this 37-year-old. This is a 23-year-old female who originally had retinoblastoma um, as a child who subsequently underwent radiation therapy and then presented to us recently to the uh, facial uh, plastic uh, uh, clinic because of her asymmetry and uh, was basically wanting to get something done to improve her uh, facial appearance. And again, on the axial images, we can see that there is in ophthalmos you can better appreciate it on the coronal image and the, I'm sorry, on the sagittal image. And on the coronal image, we can see that there is some hypoplasia from bony arrest from the original radiation uh, therapy. This was not really evident to the, to the clinicians that she had this history of retinoblastoma. And then we pointed uh, uh, this in ophthalmos and looking for causes of it. Finally, this is another patient who presented with retrobulbar pain and um, uh, intermittent proptosis, and when we can see the uh, axial CT really doesn't give much of a hint, maybe a little proptosis. We see this little uh, punctate uh, calcific density, but when the patient valsalvos, we can see this intraconal mass. Here's your plebolet, so this was a varix. So just briefly, how do we measure uh, um, in ophthalmos and ex ophthalmos, typically ex ophthalmos is the bulging forward. When we draw our line through the lateral walls, we want to see the globe intersecting about a third to one half of the globe. And so we're really, uh, as a radiologist, we're very uh, familiar with ex the multiple causes of ex ophthalmos. What we tend to forget is in ophthalmos. So remember, uh, silent sinus syndrome, it typically is really underappreciated, but when you start looking at your sinus CTs and your orbital CTs, um, I think you'll uh, see a fair number of cases. Case number three, this is a five-year-old male who presented with otalgia. So Hilda didn't want to do the CT of the temporal bone, so uh, I got stuck doing the temporal bones. <laughs> so here are two axial images further uh, axial images. Here's uh, some coronal uh, images. Some soft tissue windows through the uh, uh, temporal bone. Okay, so which one of the following is the best diagnosis? Number one, acute colescent mastoiditis, acute non-colescent mastoiditis. Number three, congenital cholesteatoma, Number four, acquired cholesteatoma. Number five, fibrous dysplasia. You can start the timer, please. So again, here is a key axial image and the coronal image. Okay, we can see that um, most of you guys uh, responded acute cholescent mastoiditis, which is the correct answer. All the following are true except, number one, erosion of mastoid septa, most sensitive and specific CT finding distinguishing coalescent from non-coalescent mastoiditis. Subperiosteal abscess occurs by direct extension of inflammation through external mastoid cortex. Bony changes due to hyperemia, local acidosis, and calcium dissolution. Bezold's abscess occurs in the periauricular soft tissues and mastoidectomy may be the treatment of choice. If you can start the timer, please. So a lot of choices, a lot of words, so I won't repeat them. Okay, so we have a fair, uh, multiple different answers going from uh, number one to number five. So 
This is a little tricky. Basalt's abscess typically occurs along the sternocleidomastoid region because typically it's erosive changes along the mastoid tip with secondary extension. And this uh, basalt actually described in the late 1800s uh, multiple different types of abscesses from uh, mastoiditis. Okay, just so briefly talking about um, mastoiditis and orotitis media for those of us who have toddlers or those of you guys who have already gone through it, you can. This is something that we all have to deal with as parents. This is the second most common disease of children after upper respiratory infections. Two-thirds of children at least have one episode by age three. And this is felt due to secondary to the horizontal uh, orientation of the eustachian tube and, may, and also hypertrophic uh, adenoidal tissues. The middle ear, the mastoid, and pneumatized petrous bones are felt to be extensions of the upper respiratory tract. Acute mastoiditis is, is typically the sequela of a viral URI as the mucosal barrier is disrupted and then microorganisms can then adhere and grow. So typically for acute mastoiditis, it's the vast majority of cured after antibiotics and typically no imaging is necessary. If we do image these patients, we may see nonspecific debris in the middle ear uh, and mastoid, and we may see fluid levels. The, the key is that the mastoid septa, the acicular chains, the internal and external mastoid cortices are typically preserved. If these patients are chronic, the ANT surgeon or the pediatrician will see uh, a fluid beyond the persistent uh, behind the tympanic membrane after three months. So coalescent mastoiditis is mucoperiosteal disease which extends to bone, and here we'll see septal erosions with intramastoid empyema. This still may spontaneously resolve if there's anterior spread through a perforated tympanic membrane. So again, when we say coalescent mastoiditis, we're going to see debris filling the mastoid, poor definition, destruction of mastoid septa, so that you'll see destruction of the internal and external uh, mastoid um, cortex. And these patients uh, typically will require mastoidectomy for uh, drainage of the uh, pus. So some of the complications of mastoiditis. Well, we'll see a cholestate mastoiditis is in this particular case where we have uh, some subsequent complications. We can develop a subperiosteal um, abscess. We can get an epidural abscess. We can get sinus thrombosis. Subdural empyema can subsequently develop. We can get a brain abscess. We can get... Um, Meningitis, if it starts to inflame the meninges, we can get carotid artery involvement. So if you think that this is not enough complications, well, there are several other complications of mastoiditis. We can get venous infarction from the sinus thrombosis, labyrinthitis, petrous apicitis, otitic hydrocephalus, and facial nerve palsy. So there's a wide spectrum of complications from mastoiditis, and this is something that we really have to be uh, aware of. So fibrous dysplasia is something I just threw in. Remember the ground glass uh, appearance. Again, here the mastoid air cells are uh, pretty much uh, preserved in terms of being well aerated. This is a patient with a congenital cholesteatoma. They typically are uh, seen in uh, 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 young uh, kids. Um, they typically occur in the anterior superior portion of the epitympanum typically do not have erosive changes er early. This is the patient's subsequent uh, uh, interoperative view. And again, remember, it's this, this is what the ENT surgeon is going to see, this pearly white uh, ball, which is the uh, cholesteatoma. In terms of acquired cholesteatoma in this uh, adult, we can see on these four images, we can see soft tissue filling uh, the middle ear with expansion of the atticus antrum. You can see some erosive changes of the uh, head of the malleus as well as portions of the body. Again, we can see some soft tissue within um, the rest of the mastoid aerosols and the coronal images. We can see thinning and dehiscence of the tegment. Again, soft tissue filling uh, the middle ear cavity. Again, some erosive uh, changes. The other thing we want to always look for is the to evaluate is the lateral semicircular canal, make sure that there's no fistula formation. And in this particular case, we can see some bony changes, uh, erosive changes along that facial horizontal segment of that facial nerve. 